This morning's guest leads a real wild life because that's his job. Who is he? You'll meet him coming up next on All American People. Good morning. Welcome to All American People. This morning we're at the Holiday Cottage at Brook Green Gardens, one of the South's most amazing destinations. We're focused on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Waccamaw National Refu Wildlife Refuge. Golly, it's a, it's a big deal, Craig, and we're visiting with the uh, refuge's manager, Craig Sasser. Good Thank morning, you. Craig. Forgive me, I should have had this map right in front of me of the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge, and it really is that. This is a federal is. thing. I mean, this is a big deal. It is. Very special place in our community. It's a new refuge, and, um, and so it's evolving land acquisition programs and a lot of stuff going on. Right. Well, you know, when folks hear the word refuge, I don't know if they can take that in other than knowing that it's clearly something of some significance. How did the idea of creating the Waccamaw no National Wildlife Refuge come about? Well, it, it actually came from a conservation organization, the Winyah Bay Focus Area, which is a group of state, private, and, uh, and uh, federal land managers. And uh, they proposed this area for a refuge. Uh, there was a lot of timber company holdings in this area. It's a great place, a lot of wildlife habitat. And so in 1994, we started a planning process that went about two years, just hundreds of public meetings. We got a lot of input on the size and the habitats and all the considerations that the community wanted us to, to look at. And out of that, we created Waccamaw Refuge, which was actually established in 1997. In 1997, okay. That's right. So you're coming up on the 15 year anniversary yes. next year. Yes. That's a, that's, and what would be the southernmost point and the, is there a northern, southern, east, west? Right, the, the northernmost part of our acquisition boundary, which is an approved boundary that we can buy land in, is the uh, Conway, just below the city of Conway. And it runs down the Waccamaw River and goes back up the PD to the Woodbury Track, which is um, in Marion County and up near 378 where it crosses the PD. And then it comes back down and goes all the way around the lower end of Sandy Island. Um, there is some land just below Sandy Island uh, that's part of, of um, the old historic rice field district. And then it goes mm -hmm. back up to Conway. So kind of shaped like rabbit ears, uh, includes mm -hmm. Waccamaw and the PD and a little bit of the Little PD River. Mm. Golly, Craig. How about yourself? Did you, have you been involved with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for... I have. I have. I started my career um, in the Ecological Services Office and, and worked there for about a year before I was uh, loaned to refuges to plan this project. Right. And uh, so I've been working on it as the project biologist. Um, I had a great team of, fo of support folks that helped me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the refuge was established, there was a position as a refuge manager advertised, and, um, and so I felt like it was probably a good chance for me to transition a little bit from the biology side of the planning effort and more to the administrative, so I mm -hmm. applied and got the manager's job. Well, what, is the biology position still there? Is that? Well, there's, we don't have a biologist on staff, so I still serve that role, and I have right. a number of staff people on board that are biologists by trade, so sure. I get a lot of uh, support on that end. A lot of the bio? Yeah. Well, what, what all would that entail if you, uh, I mean, let's say you were just doing that still and not focused on the administrative side. What, what all did that entail when you were just doing that? Well, uh, a lot of the earlier phase of the refuge planning was looking at habitats, trying to plan out how much is enough to preserve, right. how much uh, of public support public use that we can incorporate and looking at the balancing act of managing wildlife and public use. And as we got more and more into the administrative side of things, which is kind of a big part of my role now, looking at annual budgets, um, trying to do programs and expand our reach into the community and balancing 
both the wildlife habitat management that we do by trade and, right. and, and on a daily basis to the uh, community support, um, the roles, other roles that the refuge plays now. Mm, golly, Craig. Now, is this something you thought about at an early age getting into this? Had you been growing up, you know, folks want to be a fireman or be a doctor? I mean, did you say, I want to be out in nature, I'm going to make a difference? I, I would say that uh, I tell people quite often that if, if I knew about this position when I was five, this was what I wanted to do with my life. Wow. But uh, I was exposed to the area that's now the refuge at a very early age. It's been very important to me and my family and a lot right. of our friends. So being able to work in, in that area of protecting a lot of that and mm -hmm. uh, and exposing the public to it at an early age um, is kind of where my mission kind of took me. Yeah, now when you say exposing the public to it, what do you mean by that? You mean just making sure they understand both the responsibility associated with the area as well as what they can potentially get out of it? Well, uh, how much they can enjoy the area? A lot of the younger kids these days aren't raised in the rural communities, aren't raised on farms, don't have exposure to a lot of the things that that um, seem first nature for, uh, for at least me and a lot of folks that grew up years ago. And so what we're trying to do now is get the kids outside, um, expose them to the wildlife, expose them to the habitats, right. show the community functions, um, the preservation of drinking water uh, that our rivers um, are afforded by the protection of the lands around it, right. um, teaching them about relationships with nature. Uh, one of our themes in our visitor center is kind of man's role in shaping the environment. So mm. uh, we want people to understand that we're protecting it, uh, we're managing it, we're, we're involving ourselves in the actual lands around us and, uh, and understanding our role both as stewards and as users for these uh, resources. That's great, Craig. When people think about having a, you know, really pursuing a goal of a green society and being mm -hmm. much more sensitive to what happens, when you, when, when you hear about that, that really resonates Exactly. I and mean, really speaks to you. I mean, this is for real. I mean, it, people aren't just kooks who want a, right. a green society. <laughs> exactly. And a lot of the habitats that we see today that seem pristine in nature may have been very uh, actively managed, whether it was through forestry uh, products or the rice culture. A lot of things that have taken place on these lands, they've shaped them. And they are very impressive habitats today um, through man's involvement. So mm -hmm. we want people to understand that we're not just putting signs up that say stay out. Uh, right. We have public use. Uh, we we um, do a lot of habitat management. Uh, right. Some of it's wetland management, just like the rice culture. So we're, we're teaching a lot of this to uh, the students that come through the refuge as well as just the general visitors. Yes. Speaking of visitors, if a viewer needs to get off now, get off to work or out of the house, is there a good phone number for someone to call? Of course, we want to learn sure. about the location. I believe it's on Highway 701, but mm -hmm. is there a good phone number for them to call to get more information or even to go online? Well, our, our uh, visitor center, environmental education center, is the main location for getting information out to the public. And our phone number is 843. Right. 527-8069. And you're open, is that Monday through Friday or? Right now we're, we're open Monday through Friday and we are doing some weekend programs Great. and I ask any visitor interested to call ahead. Um, we've got volunteers that run our visitor center on the weekend. Right. So right now we've got some uh, a good uh, resource there that will be open this spring on Saturdays. Well, I want to hear more about the visitor opportunities, but if they call now, the 843-527-8069, of course, I think you said earlier, you all are open Monday through Friday at least 8 to 4. Exactly. And then there's some of the weekend opportunities as well. Exactly. What are some potential volunteer opportunities? What could a viewer do if they were interested in getting out to the refuge, learning more about the refuge and the education center. Sure, well we've got an endless supply of volunteer opportunities and mm -hmm. a lot of those are based on the skill set of individuals that approach us about volunteering. Right. Uh, one of the things that is near and dear to my heart is getting this environmental education center open on the weekends so that the local kids can come in and, and see the, the exhibits and, and experience the refuge um, and, and the beautiful site where our environmental ed center is. 
So volunteers have helped us open that up on Saturdays, and, um, and that's a big support role that we're after. Uh, we also have trail building. We've got uh, miles and miles of trails, and we're building new trails. We've got uh, volunteers that are retired teachers that help with environmental ed programs. Right. We've got uh, individuals that just like to get outside and, and help mm -hmm. with landscaping needs around the environmental ed center. Uh, so we, we interview individuals when they call us and find out what their interests are and we try to plug them in wherever we can. Probably not a lot of opportunities to volunteer for the federal government. I mean, <laughs> so this is a, a real special one in our area to be able to it be is. around and, and, and it, to volunteer. We really, really depend on volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, they make up for all of the shortfalls that we might have on staff and budgets. And so, um, mm -hmm. so one of our staff positions is managing volunteers just so that we can, we can uh, expand our programs and keep them going to be available and open on Saturdays, particularly mm -hmm. important with that goal of reaching students who may not be able to get some time off from school, the school yep. may not uh, find a way to be able to get them there or may not mm -hmm. open that door for them to be able to bust, be able to be bust in. You had shared earlier this morning the importance of being on Highway 701, assuming that lots of other great locations, even along 17, that you sure. could have looked at what was the significance of being there on 701? Really, I mean, we found an incredible site um, which really didn't drive our decision to put the center there. Mm -hmm. we, we felt like we needed to find a location, one that would expose the public to the refuge. And so if we had it on a site that was along Highway 17 or somewhere disjunct from the refuge, it would be really hard to convey the scenery and the habitats that the refuge represents. Right. But more importantly, the um, rural schools on the western side of the PD and the Waccamaw Rivers that um, may be too far removed from a lot of the incredible sites that we have like Brook Green Gardens and Huntington right. Beach State Park and Hobcall, a lot of those sites are just a little too far from these schools. So we chose to pick a site that would serve rural schools mm -hmm. as our primary objective rather than the, the casual visitors. Right. And we still get a lot of those, but we really are serving those schools. And by being open on the weekends, a lot of the students that get exposed come back with their parents and bring them in. Right. So, so we're catching the whole family. And, um, and it's in incredible to go through a lot of these programs and learn how many students that live right along the PD that have never seen the river, um, don't know how to swim or don't have access. And uh, so we're, we're connecting people that live right in the area around the refuge. That is tremendous, Greg. That has got to be a great uh, yeah. feeling for you. Well, I want to talk some about the, the Cox uh, Ferry Lake Recreation mm -hmm. Area, but before that, for a, it's I think October 09, you said. So this October, it'll be a two year anniversary of the opening yep. of the Environmental Education Center. What would a viewer find? What, what does that student see when they walk in for the first time or that parent or other that walks into the Environmental Education Center for the first time? Uh, what are they going to see when they walk in? Well, it is a incredible facility and, and I played a small part in the development of it. There were a lot of good people that helped develop this facility. We've got a, a state-of-the-art wet lab classroom that's got a smart board and it's got a lot of hands-on uh, animals that we use to demonstrate various lessons um, as well as a lot of, of uh, mm -hmm. unique um, lab settings to, to basically go out and do field work and bring uh, samples in and sort them in the wet lab. Right. We've got an exhibit mm -hmm. hall that represents all the habitats in our refuge, uh, the Blackwater, the Alluvial River, Sandy Island, uh, the land, the tide lands down below Sandy Island, a lot of the wildlife in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting kind of hands-on uh, design so that the kids get to, uh, to explore and, and to interact with the exhibits.